Welcome, everybody, and happy Halloween. Uh, yes. 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 Happy Halloween. You know, we're going to talk in a little while, of course, about a number of things, including the uh, protest by NFL players, uh, you, you know, kneeling during the national anthem to protest racial injustices. Um, luckily, the New Yorker came out with some assistance, some guidance on how NFL players can protest but not upset anyone. One example was a player protesting racial injustice is permitted to raise his fist during the anthem as long as the fist is inside one of those oversized foam fingers. So <laughs> we're keeping it light. That's good. No. <laughs> well, their humor column did. That what was that Borowitz? No, actually, it wasn't. Um, I'm John Zipperer, your host for Week to Week and the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. Very glad you're all here. On today's program, we will, of course, get into the NFL situation, as well as we'll discuss these first indictments from the Robert Mueller investigation. Uh, we'll talk about Diane Feinstein's future, the ever-increasing and ever-expanding sexual harassment scandal, and other political news. And, of course, we'll end the evening with our live news quiz. Now, um, I always note the Commonwealth Club is a place for people with a wide range of views, so any opinions that are expressed up here are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. Now let's meet our panelists for dead today. I uh, cannot speak. <laughs> for dead, you said? <laughs> <laughs> it's Halloween. Yeah, it right. did seem a little like you said that, John. <laughs> Freudian slip. We'll see what happens during this program. Uh, so I'll start on the far end of the stage there with Chuck Nevius, C.W. Nevius. He's a columnist for the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. And, of course, longtime former columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. Thanks very much. You can find him on Twitter at C.W. Nevius. Next to him is Carson Bruno, Assistant Dean for Admission and Program Relations at the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. He's also the author of the California Real Politique News Letter, and he's on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno. So welcome back, Carson. Thank you. And next to me is Bob Butler, a reporter for KCBS Radio. You can follow him on Twitter at BobButler7. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. So I've seen a lot of you here before, so you know how we do this. There are question cards spread throughout the room. Write down some questions, and Corey will pick them up and deliver them to me, and I'll try to read as many as I can during the program. On to our roundtable. So on Friday, we heard that Robert Mueller would be releasing the first indictments of one or more people in his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and in fact, it turned out that there was more than one indictment issued Former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort and his associate Rick Gates were indicted on charges of conspiracy against the United States, money laundering, being an unregistered foreign agent, and seven counts of failing to file reports of foreign bank and uh, financial accounts. Now, Manafort and Gates both pled not guilty, uh, but we also learned that a third individual, George Papadopoulos, has pled guilty to a charge of making false statements to federal investigators. So, Carson, let's start with you. What do you make of Mueller's indictments on Monday? <laughs> I think the first thing to really kind of see them as is uh, kind of a, a crystal ball into what Mueller is thinking um, of how he's going about this investigation. Uh, it's very deliberate, very intentional. Um, it's not going to be rushed. And he's going to really, I think, kind of do these indictments as the evidence really kind of comes into play. Um, he's not going to kind of get everything into one big kind of batch and then take care of it all at the end. Mm -hmm. It's going to be this kind of trickle approach, I think, um, which politically could be difficult for the Trump administration and the White House, um, but also for Democrats, too. I mean, because it's going to it could ensnarl some of them as we're seeing maybe um, John Pod uh, Podesta's brother maybe being ensnarled in this as well. Talk a little um, bit about that. Tony, Tony Podesta. Tony Podesta. Yeah. So. W details are still kind of coming out. Uh, we're not really too sure if it's connected to what Mueller is doing or not, but there's a chance that uh, Tony Podesta, who is John Podesta's brother, John Podesta being the chairman, I believe, of the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, he may get kind of connected into all of this investigation too, which really goes to show that Mueller really is not looking at this just from the Trump campaign perspective, but more broadly of how is Russia, how are for foreign agents really kind of interacting and interfering with the entire presidential or entire electoral system in the United States, um, which could have huge ramifications across the entire board. Um, but it's very, it's very telling about how Mueller is going to go about this, um, as well as 
uh, difficult for the Trump administration. The biggest thing here really is the George Papadopoulos um, situation, well, in my or opinion. As Wolf Blitzer called him <laughs> George Stephanopoulos. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> George Mouthful, <laughs> um, and uh, that one may be the more difficult one for the for the administration and for the campaign, just because that that plea bargain or that plea deal is d directly connected to what's happening and what happened in the campaign. Uh, this stuff with Manafort and Gates so far really predates the campaign um, and his relationship with Trump, although him being part of the Trump campaign and being such a major player in the campaign definitely does uh, raise additional questions. Okay. Uh, Bob? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, Chuck, go ahead. No, Bob, Bob, go ahead. Well, I was going <laughs> to say, I mean, if you listen to the campaign, Manafort was a minor player in the campaign for only a short period of time. Papadopoulos was basically a coffee boy that wasn't very involved in the campaign. He was a volunteer, but it, but I noted that a lot of the campaign people were volunteers, partly because Trump wouldn't pay them. Um, and we actually had some of the D.C. DC volunteer staff quit because they wouldn't get paid. They were told they're going to get paid. So I don't know how many of these people that, that applies to, but I think... With Papadopoulos, the fact that, that they arrested him in July and then he copped a plea sometime between July and October, and in the meantime, he's been talking to the FBI. So I don't know what he knows. And let me just say up front, I don't know whether or not Donald Trump was involved in collusion with the Russians. I don't know whether or not his campaign was involved in collusion with the Russians. What I will say is that Collusion in itself is not a crime. Lying about it is. And I think that's what we're at right now. A lot of people have lied about their involvement with the Russians, including his former national security advisor, who we haven't heard about. And I think that may be the next shoe to drop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chuck. Well, I think uh, a lot of people expected Manafort. I think Gates, we probably didn't know as well as other people. But Papadopoulos, by all accounts, was a surprise. And I would say not a pleasant surprise for the president. However, he reacted promptly. Uh, we barely know who he is, but we do know he's a liar. So that's, that's a good, sensible <laughs> reproach to that. But I think Carson is right. This is the beginning of the squeeze, the big squeeze. And I actually heard, uh, because I'm retired and I watch a lot of CNN, uh, people talking about Papadopoulos' uh, deal might have included wearing a wire. I mean, we're talking serious business. And it's, you know, on one hand, it's very simple to be interviewed by someone and say, oh, no, I, I knew nothing about that. When you do that to the FBI, it turns out to be a lot more serious than a lot of us thought. And when they put the squeeze on him, I think we're looking at a, at a, at a more serious thing. And I just would say, I mean, of the presidents that we've had, Donald Trump is certainly one of the oddest, but he's also one of the, the angriest. I mean, day after day, we hear about him seething and, and raging and, and lashing out and so forth. And it just seems unsustainable. Uh, but I think we've also seen that there's going to have to be some kind of dead bang proof because he will deny everything, and he has. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. Well, he's denied that uh, he knew anything about what was going on. But if you talk to people who've known him back in the business world, it was a family-run business, and he knew everything that was going on. So it's almost like that's how he's running the country, so it's kind of hard to believe he did not know these calls were being made. Maybe he didn't, but based on his prior history, I, I don't know. Someone in the audience asks about the Paul Manafort issues. Paul Manafort, by the way, had been uh, the campaign manager for a portion of Trump's campaign, uh, presidential campaign. Uh, and they, they ask, isn't he in trouble for things in these indictments that he did before he worked for Trump. Yes. And is that kind I mean, what both, you know, independent uh, uh, prosec in, uh, prosecutors, uh, special prosecutors, um, part of the danger of them is that they can kind of go anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, and is that in itself a sign of just how far Mueller is willing to push this? I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think this really goes to show that he's not going to keep this very narrow on just mm -hmm. the, the Trump 2016 presidential campaign, that it will potentially seep into other areas where the evidence takes him. And Mueller is, at the end of the day, a fantastic investigator and in that he will go where the evidence takes him. He doesn't really care about any sort of biases going into the into the investigation. He cares about what the evidence is speaking to him. And the evidence took him in this direction, which 
the Manafort dealings were kind of the worst kept secret in Washington, D.C., uh, even when uh, he was chosen as the head of the uh, Trump campaign back at, at, at that period of time. Uh, so it's not surprising that this is kind of the first shoe to drop because this is really kind of the where the the easiest evidence for Mueller to find. Mm-hmm. The big question is, do these relationships that Manafort had before the campaign, really, before he got involved in the campaign, uh, did they seep into the way he managed the campaign uh, when he was running it? I would just like to have him explain how he spent half a million dollars on suits mm-hmm. because that was... <laughs> You know, the, the head-on collision that is head, we're headed for here is if Mueller goes to finances of the Trump campaign. Right. And he has already said, President Trump has already said, that's a red line. And as Nancy Pelosi said, the president doesn't get to set red lines. Mm-hmm. And so we're headed to something here. It's, it seems almost inevitable that we're going to hear something about tax returns. Right. We're going to hear something. I mean, we're already talking to Manafort about money laundering. I mean, the... We've made the analogy a million times, but this is a lot of smoke. You know, there's got to be, something's got to be on fire. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Specifically but, about, sorry. Go ahead. Specifically about Paul Manafort and his dealings in Ukraine and, and Russia and whether it affected anything here. I would suggest folks go to the Washington, Washington Post website, read Ann Applebaum's column. Ann Applebaum is a longtime journalist, uh, specializes in the, that Central European and Eastern European history. Um, is married to the former foreign minister of Poland, um, but she she goes into that, and of course she's very much opposed to Trump, so she's coming at this from her viewpoint. But it's a column, but it, it's 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 worth reading because she's got good background and and pointing out, oh, he did this and he did this, and that there are a lot of similarities that people might find. Now, someone says. The 800-pound gorilla in the room, we always cover the simians in this program. <laughs> the 800-pound gorilla in the room is the pardon powers of the president. Please discuss. Bob? Well, I mean, you would think that somebody would have to be convicted before they got pardoned. Um, but I suspect that there may be some thought of pardoning people bef- if once they're charged, they just pardon them. And that's going to present a crisis um, in the country and also in the House, because that is for most. Yes, the president has the power to do that. But I think with the Arpaio pardon, people said this was totally inappropriate. And if he all of a sudden pardons pardoned Manafort and Gates and, and Papadopoulos, well, Papadopoulos has already pleaded guilty, so he's already been convicted. He can, he can you know, I guess, pardon him, too. But if you start using that pardon power too much, it's going to put the Republicans um, and the Democrats in a tough spot. Do you allow the president to get away with that, or do you try to rein him in? So far, we've seen no no stomach on one side of the aisle to do anything to rein the president in, and I'm not sure that's going to continue or not. We keep hearing this, you know, that the Republicans are going to be in a tough spot. And I'm old enough to remember, this is going to be an odd analogy, but I remember Rocky and Bullwinkle. You remember fractured fairy tales? <laughs> This is like the emperor has no clothes. Is, you know, if Trump pardons these people, if he if he stretches the truth, if he goes down this line, you keep thinking someone's going to say the emperor has no clothes, and that'll be it. Except that John McCain said it, Bob Corker said it, you know, uh, George Bush said it, uh, Jeff Flake said it, and there's been no effect. The parade continues, and at some point, that's what's going to have to happen. Republicans are going to have to say this is not serving my best interest, and let's be honest. My best interest is the most important thing in this. And so far, we haven't seen it. It may be the 2018 elections. So, yeah. if, we, if we find that, that his coattails are, are an inch long, maybe that's the deal. But the Republicans are going to have to be the ones to step up for this. And they don't want to. They don't want to. Because it, it sounds dangerous. It sounds like something that might be a bad thing. And with Bob Corker and Jeff Flake, and there's a school of thought that you can say that the Trump people can say, we won this. Both those guys are gone. They're, they're leaving. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of guys like that. So it's, we're all hanging fire to see what the Republicans are going to do. It's, I mean, there's two courts here. There's the, the legal court, the, yeah. the judicial system, uh, but there's also the court of public opinion. And I feel that if he starts going down the pre-pardoning route, that that's going to maybe potentially uh, be one of the tripping points mm-hmm. for the court of public opinion. Or Fire Mueller. Or Fire Mueller, yes, yes. Um, 
Because it's and it's not really kind of what the nation as a whole is thinking. I mean, his approval ratings are pretty, pretty, pretty bad um, <laughs> by any historical measures. Uh, it's what Republicans think, what Republican voters think, Trump supporters think. And if movement starts to go against him uh, with that cohort, then House Republicans, other Senate Republicans may start to really start to think to themselves, wait a minute, this is not, like Chuck was saying, not in my best interest, not in my self-interest. And that's when you're going to start to see movement. The big question is, do we start to see other flakes and corkers start to really kind of pop out of the woodwork? You have a number of people. Dean Heller in Nevada is not doing well with uh, Republican voters there right now. He could decide to say, like Jeff Flake did in Arizona, say, you know what, screw this, I'm out of here. Um, then he becomes free to really be a, a, a never trumper in the in the Senate. You have a number of other uh, Republican um, senators who don't really need Trump to win their election, either because they're not up um, yeah. or because they are in states that really don't speak well to him or in Hatch, Mike Lee in Utah, Susan Collins in Maine. You have uh, Lisa Murkowski in uh, Alaska. Right. So. As these people start to maybe kind of feel a little bit emboldened mm -hmm. by kind of what's happening, maybe then kind of movement can start happening within within the Senate at least. And I, uh, I would just say that my impression of the Republican Party is there's, there's a lot of flakes and corkers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, what we that's a good <laughs> to take that seriously. Uh, what you do hear is more. that <laughs> they are saying what a lot of other Republican senators will say privately, just not publicly. Um, someone in the audience asks, I think hopefully, what does Trump have to, when does Trump have to speak under oath? Now, he does not need to be indicted for that cause, because wasn't Bill Clinton giving his testimony under oath before he, he hadn't been indicted of right. anything? He was doing a deposition. He, he, yeah, a deposition. He, he agreed to do it, didn't he? He had agreed. That, I, I think he agreed to testify under yeah. oath. Okay, he can't be made to. No. Okay. No. Interesting. Um, is Mike Pence vulnerable if they pressure Flynn, the former national security advisor. Only, he, uh, if, only if he's sitting at a table with another woman. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> now, you know, the door closed. <laughs> the Flynn Pence relationship, I mean, the reason why Flynn was fired ostensibly is because he lied to the vice president about what he said during his testimony. In other words, I didn't, I didn't call Kislyak, I didn't call anybody, I didn't make any promises to them. And then they find out through the intelligence agencies that he did. Mm -hmm. You're asking me to believe that he talked to the vice president and lied to the vice president and that's why he got fired? No, I think he got fired because they found out that he got caught. And I'd be very surprised that the vice president didn't know what he knew um, at the time when they were talking. So for the vice president to go on national television and say, I didn't know anything about this, I, I'm, uh, my, my, my reporter's spidey sense kind of go, went off when I saw that. <laughs> I mean, in fact, the matter is anyone involved in the campaign is potentially um, at risk here. If some, Again, if collusion actually was occurring yeah. and if there's, there is a smoking gun. Um, and there's, those are still two big ifs that we still don't know, nor probably won't know for quite some time. This is not going to be something that's going to be done before the 2018 midterms or maybe even before the next presidential election in 2020. This could take a lot of time to figure out. Well, before we move off this topic, but this is related and this is something we, in fact, were talking about before the program, which is uh, today the, the folks from Twitter, Facebook and uh, Google were all in Washington, D.C. testifying about, uh, well, basically Russian manipulation of social media. Um, and someone asks, you know, saying the inquiry is interesting, but isn't the real story there uh, the way we were manipulated? I mean, the hundreds of, of, or I should say, the 126 million messages, I guess, that were, uh, you know, received by Facebook folks and things like that. I think the story is not that we were manipulated. The story is that people still don't know they're manipulated, and I see them on, on my Facebook page all the time. I would, and I would say on the right and the left. Mm -hmm. uh, on the right and the left, but uh, you know, I, let's just say that there are people that still believe some of the stuff that was put out um, on on social media mm -hmm. that has been proven to be false, and they still believe it. I mean, I, <laughs> I saw a great post today. Of, of, it had to do with the Uranium One story. They're saying that why are we going down the road of the indictments? That's a distraction from the Uranium One story. I would, I would submit that it's the other way around, but you can't convince people of that. 
I think that one of the things that's happened is um, it is social media is still very new technology. And I don't think, and I, I have some inside information, but not too much, Facebook realized how this could be manipulated. You heard Mark Zuckerberg say, that's ridiculous, it couldn't have happened. And what I've heard is uh, one of the things that you get when you join Facebook is you have an opportunity to put down your uh, place of work while, while you're employed. And some people put down horrible anti-Semitic things there. I hate Jews. The bots who are running Facebook thought, oh, there's a group of people that have a common interest, let's put them together. Well, you can't do that, okay? Today, Facebook is saying any of the ads that you see on Facebook, you'll be able to click on and see exactly who financed those ads. Well, that's a great idea. Would have been a good idea five years ago, mm -hmm. but we're learning how this ago. works. And I think it's a, it's a process. It doesn't mean it wasn't serious. It doesn't mean it didn't affect the election. But I think they're catching up like everyone else to, to what's going on. And there's two large, larger, I think, pictures or issues here. One, you have the siloing of kind of the American populace and how they get their news, good point. Um, how, they're, how they get their information. You know, if you think back to the good old days, wherever you want to say it, you got your news from the nightly news and you know, their major networks. And you, you, or newspapers. Or newspapers. Or, or newspapers, or sorry. Or the, the radio. Carson's too young. Or the He's radio. Remembered. Sorry. <laughs> Dating myself here. Um, <laughs> And, but now you literally can go on the internet, onto cable news if you want to, and listen, read, or see exactly what you want to listen, exactly. read, and see. Exactly, that's right. Um, and that's a, a, a larger systemic problem uh, that I don't think anyone really has an answer to, mm -hmm. nor mm -hmm. really a, a true solution to kind of figure out how to kind of address this. Um, but then also on the flip side, you have these major social media networks, and the, the idea of kind of censorship starts coming into play and kind of First Amendment rights about what is free speech, what isn't free speech, what is allowed to be said, and do we want the Zuckerbergs uh, bots to be kind of being the arbiters are of First Amendment rights? Do we want uh, Twitter to be saying, no, you can't, you don't have a voice anymore because of X, Y, and Z? Um, that becomes a problematic situation for society if we start to kind of go down that route. So it's, we're in this flux right now that we, I'm not sure that really we'll figure out a way to kind of get out of anytime soon. You mentioned the uranium sale. This is a controversy over Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, having signed off on or something, a, a uranium sale to Russia. Um, Connected to the Clinton Foundation and there's a lot of over tangles here. Yeah. Um, but uh, so White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders has another Clinton thing they're pushing, which and she said uh, recently, quote, there's clear evidence of the Clinton campaign colluding with Russian intelligence to spread disinformation and smear the president to influence the election, unquote. She's referring to the Clinton administration apparently being one of the f folks uh, who paid for this uh, infamous dossier, Steel dossier. Yeah, uh, of uh, opposition research on Donald Trump. Um, Bob, distraction, anything interesting there? No, I think there is distraction. I mean, so the facts are that the Republicans started to do some opposition research on Donald Trump. I think it was the news, the Republican newspaper. I forget the name of which one it was. But they paid this company, Fusion GPS, to do opposition, opposition research. Um, when Trump got the nomination, or it was close to getting the nomination, they said, well, why waste our money? You know, we, he's going to get it. We can't stop him. Well, in that period between the time that they quit paying them, the research was still going on, and Fusion GPS went to the Democrats and said, well, look, we started doing this digging into what Trump's background. We found some interesting stuff. <laughs> Do you want us to continue? And the DNC have said, well, absolutely, and they paid them the money. That was in the period of time when Rich, uh, Steele was hired, and he had all these contacts in Russia, and he came back with all this information and put it into a dossier. Now, some of this information apparently has already been corroborated by the FBI. Some of the other stuff that we've heard about, the very salacious stuff, has not. But the truth of the matter is that what was being done has been done by everybody. It's called opposition research. And the fact, when you find something that you find to be totally you know, illegal, such as the Russians trying to say, listen, 
call me up. I got some bet, some dirt on Hillary Clinton that will help you in the election. That's when the, the first call is supposed to go to the federal government, and it wasn't done. So that I'm not sure of the timeline between all that, but did they pay for it? Yes, they did. Was it illegal? No, it was not. And I think what Hillary Clinton has said is Fox News should be reminded, I, I didn't win the presidential election. <laughs> <laughs> I understand your interest in me, but the president is Donald Trump, and let's get to the bottom of what's going on with him. Yeah. Well, let's uh, stick here into California then and talk about our senior senator, Dianne Feinstein, uh, following a great deal of public debate, including here on Week to Week, about whether Dianne Feinstein could, should, or would run for re-election. She, of course, made it official earlier this month. She will seek another term. Carson, can you give us some insight into what state Republicans uh, are thinking? I mean, do they have a candidate they think can take her on? And if not, Good luck how do they run, vote? Right? Do they, would they rather see Feinstein replaced or would they rather see her in? Well, trying to get insight into the California Republicans at this point is, you know, <laughs> um, This is coming from a California talking. Republican. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, if, if the California Republicans were being honest with themselves, they would love, that, love Feinstein to continue being the U.S. Senator from California. Because anyone replacing Dianne Feinstein is going to be significantly to the left of her. Um, and not, not necessarily ideology, because Dianne Feinstein really is a liberal at, at her heart. She plays a good moderate on TV. Um, <laughs> but she is truly a, she is a liberal. I mean, come on. Um, and, uh, but it's more in her tone and her way of going about business in the Senate. And the Senate is a very collegial, very uh, relationship-oriented body, and it's designed to be that way. Um, and so you really prosper as a senator if you're willing to kind of go down that route. Um, anyone who replaces her really probably won't, at least initially, mm -hmm. uh, which is a detriment to California as a whole, but then also particularly to uh, Republicans in the states uh, who are going to be left without a, a, a true voice in the U.S. Senate regardless of the situation. Um, and that played... I mean, it, 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 it's exactly what's happening. I mean, Kevin DeLeon would be much not uh, in what the California Republicans would ever want um, representing them in, in D.C. So um, it's, it's to their benefit to support her. Um, now, politically speaking, it's to their benefit to run someone and one person um, who can run a competent campaign, who can just get be on the ballot, not splinter the, the 25 to maybe 30 percent, we'll see uh, uh, when 2018 rolls around, uh, of the vote, so that it is a Republican against Dianne Feinstein and not two Democrats, because that will just decimate um, their House races that are going to be very competitive. So a, a Democrat that's going to run against Dianne Feinstein in the primary is going to have to run to the left of her. And that's, I think that's what you're saying. Now, by coincidence, I know someone on Dianne Feinstein's staff. It's, it's George Papadopoulos. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what he said was that she was legitimately wondering if she should run again. And what, she, what he said she was going to do was go ahead and raise money, see how it went, and see if someone pops up who looks like a really difficult, serious contender that she would have a more difficult time than she would like to have it. What is she, 80? 84, 84 or, years old. No one, yeah, and yes. And remember, it's a six-year term, so right. we're talking about a 90-year-old. And, you know, she occasionally, she's not exactly a, a Twitter veteran. I, she's not an electronic media kind of person. And, and that shows up from time to time. But she's got name recognition. Now she's got money. And I don't think she feels that concerned about who's running against her. And with that in mind, I think she'll go forward. But there was a sense that she was definitely weighing, is this worth the effort? And I think she's made the decision it is. Bob, any thoughts on Feinstein? You know, I saw her um, a couple of weeks ago up in Santa Rosa uh, during the fires when uh, Feinstein and, and Harris and, and the governor all came out to speak uh, to the gaggle of reporters outside a high school in Santa Rosa. And, you know, she said... It was typical. I mean, the governor comes out and speaks, then Feinstein spoke and Harris spoke. I mean, she's still, she's mellowed, but she's still got she's that spicy. gravitas yep. that, that she's always had. I remember covering her when she was the mayor here. Um, I, I think she'll do fine. I mean, nowadays, the staff does most of the work anyway. Um, 
but I think she'll be. I think I think she'll do okay. What I'm interested in is is who the Republicans might put up, because if I'm the Republican Party, I'm going to find somebody who is actually an up and comer to go up against her, because they'll be in the news a lot, and then the next time around, that person could be in a role, if not to run for her seat in the U.S. Senate, but definitely to run for the House. Yeah, I, I'm just real quickly say, up and comer is. Where are the up-and-comers? On both sides of the aisle. I mean, that's what we need. Is I, I admire Diane Feinstein. She did a great job. I, Nancy Pelosi. We've got a list of people that... But come on. We're, we've got to have those fresh faces. Where are they? Are they not running? I'm su- I, I'm, to this day, I'm still surprised that Kamala Harris got a, a, a clean field in 2016. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. We, yeah. Um, well, she's going to win I, it, so we give up. I can't. Yeah. I, of all of the statewide Democrats um, who <laughs> are just looking for something new because they're termed out eventually, uh, and you're never termed out in the Senate, um, that's w- why didn't they go for it? Uh, it, it to, to this day, it still confuses me um, that really her only opposition was Loretta Sanchez. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I think that's telling about how the California Democratic Party internally operates that all, all the stuff you don't really see in the public uh, all the backroom kind of conversations and deals and, and going ons they do it very effectively of clearing the field for the the chosen the chosen one the chosen candidate are you um, are you implying that that dinner that kamala harris and you have a newsome head where she she mm-hmm. said well i'll run for senate and you can run, run for, for governor, governor. <laughs> <laughs> look what happened um so i, I still to this day I can't, not that I that ever happened it, but, you know, but uh, just saying yeah, they conveniently share the same consultants. What a, well, just coincidence. Yeah. I mean, come on, Carson. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Gavin Newsom, you were at uh, you were asking questions at a uh, recent gubernatorial uh, debate, Bob. What 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 was your reaction to? What what did you take away from that? Well, the National Union of Healthcare Workers held a gubernatorial forum, and they invited both the Democrats and the Republicans. Four Democrats showed up: uh, Gavin Newsom. Uh, Antonio Villaraigosa, uh, uh, John Chung, and, and Delaney Easton. I thought it was a you know, asking questions of them, I, mean, I we got to east ask them one question that had maybe a, maybe a follow up. I, I asked basically what I asked Newsom is that you know, California is going to face a huge hole in the budget if you know, as we keep hearing that the health care law changes and they take away all the funding of it's twenty two billion dollars for California and what would he do to make sure people that are getting health care now don't lose it. And his response was, you know, single payer. Um, <laughs> there's enough money in the budget in California now to pay for single payer. He didn't go into details, which I didn't think he would. But you know, that's <laughs> that's the kind of thing that you get from a politician at a at a forum like that. But Gavin is Gavin is Gasm. Very very, um, you know, he carries the room. Um, he was very, as usual, very well versed on all the subjects. You know, very charismatic. Um, and at the end of the day. Uh, the healthcare workers voted to endorse him for for a governor. Uh, what I find f- fascinating is this whole thing with Feinstein. If, go- if he does become governor, Feinstein might you know serve a year or two if she's reelected, and they say you know I'm calling it quits. And at that point, the governor would would appoint, appoint. her successor. That who knows what's going to happen. I I do think. If the Democratic Party wants to be successful, not just in California, but around the country, they need to come find a way to come together because you still have the two factions, you know, the Bernie faction and, you know, these are the younger progressive people that really believe that they have a better way. Um, if they can find a way to pull everyone together and roll in the same direction, the Democratic Party can maybe maybe win in Washington. But until they do that, even in 2018, I don't like their chances. Someone uh, from the audience writes, speaking of up-and-comers, thoughts of Eric's uh, thoughts on uh, Eric Swalwell, Adam Schiff, I would add maybe Ro Khanna. Yep. I mean, there's tons, no, of, there are. tons there in are. the House delegation, um, tons in Sacramento. I mean, Alex Padilla, uh, Betty Yee, you're going to have Fiona Ma most likely taking over a Cal- California treasurer's office. Um, so there's tons. I mean... The, they're they're almost swimming too much in talent uh, in this state. They just Whereas can't get that traction. They, and it's, because there's it's bottlenecked at the top. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, Diane Feinstein again has been around for. I mean, she's been as U.S. senator since what ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, Pelosi. Uh, yeah. Pelosi, uh, the same thing. I mean, being my, uh, majority or minority leader, but leader. Um, but bef- before boxers, you know, retirements, she was also kind of around. Jerry Brown. 
Uh, so there's, it's been kind of a bottleneck at the top for a lot of these up and comers um, that will start to dissipate, but um, not, not not at least in 2020. And I would say, yeah, I would say, you know, full disclosure, I'm I'm pretty much, I'm a fan of Gavin Newsom. I, I enjoy talking to him. He's got lots of ideas. Somebody has to tell him not so many ideas. <laughs> okay? You can't, you can't go with everything. Pick a few things. Just do those things. Remember when you did the, the eight-hour state of the city? I mean, how many, how many people watched that? I, I don't think that happened. <laughs> Settle down. And I think he has. I think, uh, I think being married and having kids has, has settled him down. But he's charismatic. He's handsome. Uh, somebody told me when he was mayor, there's an information booth down in the lobby of, the, of City Hall. And one of the things traditionally they do is they put a photo of the mayor under a little glass uh, thing there at the information booth. And that woman said that photo got stolen once a day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's, he's got that look. He's got that thing. Can he harness it? And that's, that's what I'd say is my question. Well, very good. Let's move along to our next topic. Um, so what do all of these people have in common? Harvey Weinstein, Mark Halperin, Terry Richardson, Bill O'Reilly, Leon Wieseltier, George Herbert Walker Bush... Uh, the head of Amazon Studios, Vox executive Lockhart Steele, among others. Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Kevin Spacey, yeah. exactly. They, they've all been accused, Donald Trump, yep. they've all been yep. accused of sexual harassment and or assault. Chuck, what's your take on this? Is this, well, there have been talk of what, as to whether this is a, you know, moment in time, a pivotal moment, or is this something we're going through and it'll be replaced by another big news uh, story soon? Well, I think... I think I'm as oblivious as every other male to how this is going on. I mean, my first thought was, well, these are all a bunch of old, tired people. And then Mark Halpern gets, I mean, that's not the case. And I had, I went to lunch with a colleague from the Chronicle, and, and she said, I, I'll bet if you talk to every woman that you talk to, they've had some experience like this. And dutiful husband, I came home, and I, we have never talked about this. And I said to my wife, did you have an experience like that? And she said, yeah. And I think half of the population has no idea how commonplace this is. And because of that, the other half of the population has said, there's no point in talking about it because nobody seems to care. I don't know if it's a tipping point, but I know there's a lot of men who are scared mm -hmm. and are reevaluating their behavior. Mm -hmm. And that can't be a bad thing. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't I mean, know where it goes. It's kind of Carson? two directions it could go. I mean, in Hollywood particularly, I, I'm now in L.A., so I've driven many, driven, been in many Uber and Lyft cars where they're basically all driven by struggling actors, musicians. You know, <laughs> uh, it's now the new bartending, uh, waitressing job is now Lyft and, Lyft and Ubering. Um, and they're talking about this um, to, their, to their passengers uh, because they're seeing it, uh, both men and female. Are seeing it um, within the Hollywood, just bowl um, kind of culture. Uh, so if this continues to kind of come out, I mean, we we found out about Kevin Spacey yesterday. I mean, many others could come out um, a, in that manner. Um, it's going to keep it in the national news just because it is Hollywood, because these are celebrities, uh, because it is um, it, it's news that sells in a way. So that could keep it within the national dialogue, which then could force kind of the, the political dialogue to go down that route. Um, we're also starting to see it more in Sacramento. Um, Assembly member uh, Raul uh, Botanegra, who is uh, majority leader, I believe, or assistant majority leader right now in the, the Assembly, um, he was accused and disciplined when he was um, a staffer uh, for, his, for his predecessor. Um, and so is he the only one that's a sitting member in the legislature? Probably not. Will, there, will others kind of step forward and say something? Probably, now that this is kind of in the news. Uh, so it could be you know, coming back home to us here in California and could really disrupt kind of how the operations of Sacramento start to you know, go about. And then <laughs> will that filter into, into D.C. as well? Because, I mean, the, the, again, the, the power dynamics are the same in, kind of in D.C. as they would be in you know, the Hollywood casting room or even in Sacramento. And it, it's not just even in the United States. The uh, British government is going through much the same thing. Uh, they're now fine. You know, they're getting. And, and what it was was okay. They started talking to the women and who worked in uh, Parliament and, and you know worked for these the members of Parliament and such. And basically, this people started saying, "Yeah, this happens." And he did it, and he did it, and that kind of thing. You know, I'm uh, on the national board of SAG-AFTRA, 
which is the Performers Union. Um, and our president is Gabrielle Carteris. Anybody who watched 90210, she played Andrea Zuckerman. Our executive vice president is a woman. Our secretary treasurer is a woman. So we're led by women. And we had a, had a national convention just a few weeks ago. And this was, it was not a topic of conversation officially, but the women, and we have most, many of our members are women. You know, they all will tell you that they've had to experience this. I mean, the old tale of the casting couch may not be the way we think it is. And a lot of times the pressure they, they, they receive is not the straight up, you know, do me this favor and I'll make you a star. It, it's a lot more subtle than that. But it's something we had, a, our broadcast steering committee had a meeting a couple of months ago and we had a panel of women journalists and they talked about what the struggles they had coming up. You know, somebody being told that they couldn't, I can't give you a, a big enough raise because your, your co-anchor, well, he's married with, with a family, so I got to give him more money than I give you. I mean, that kind of stuff has happened for a long time. And I will say that as a man, I can't appreciate what women have experienced, but I do have a parallel. As a black person, I, I can tell you when I feel racism, and most white people can't. They don't see it. But I, I know it when I see it, just like you know it when you see it. So we have a lot of work to do um, to make sure that we, that we act, act properly and we treat women for what they're worth, which is just as, as good as we are. Uh, someone in the audience uh, mentions di distinguishing and can you distinguish between, for example, talk and action when it comes to these things. I, th I think what we're increasingly seeing is, you know, again, men who knew there was a problem but didn't realize how, how deep it was, we're, it's sinking in of, of just how much that can be damaging either way. I mean, you know, because it, it's the message you're getting of who's in charge here. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm struck by how many men when confronted Mm -hmm. knew it was wrong yeah and said kept from kevin spacey to harvey weinstein to anybody yeah oh, gee i wish i hadn't done yeah well where were you i mean i i, I can't imagine confronting someone like that and forcing yourself on them even if it wasn't a sexual act but just an inappropriate touching and then seeing them the next day at work i mean how do you look that person in the eye and say you know what happened last night? Let's forget about that. It, it just seems incomprehensible. But I think those people knew at the time they were getting away with something they shouldn't have been. I suspect we as guys can't answer that question, but I bet y'all could. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, it, I think this is clear that, as they say in the news, you know, this story has legs. This, this is going to be around for a while. It's going to last. So this will not be our last time talking about it. Um, and I'm sure the Commonwealth Club in general will also be doing specific programming on this. So let's talk about the NFL, something, in fact, a story that has legs. We talked about it on our last week. Or knees. Story. Yes. <laughs> well, exactly, knees. Um, <laughs> recently, the owner of the uh, NFL team, the Houston Texans, uh, said uh, they couldn't have, quote, inmates running the prison, unquote, when it came to whether, pl whether players stand or kneel during the national anthem. Forty of his players then knelt the following Sunday, this past week, uh, to protest his comments, among other things. Out of 53, right? Out of 53. <laughs> um, meanwhile, the NFL itself is kind of trying to contain this now and, and, and tamp down the controversy because it's hurting their business, right? Um, Chuck, did the president win on this? I mean, he, he made a, a, a very concerted issue of this mm -hmm. and there were reports at one point uh, after he had kind of started this of course on Twitter uh, he had a meeting with some conservative activists in the White House and at the time he said you know I'm gonna keep this NFL feud going it's it's good it's good for me I'm winning it well, I think the question is what was he trying to accomplish was he trying to get people to stop taking a knee then no absolutely not I mean if you wanted a textbook example of how to take a, a small, passionate group of people who have a very serious interest in a, in a cause and turn it into a much larger group of people who are even more passionate about this, this is how you do it. You, you call them SOBs, you tell them they should get off the sideline. I mean, the players are the NFL. I mean, the owner, McNair hasn't made a tackle. I mean, I, I'd like to see him make a tackle, but the owner of the Houston Texans. And the, and the way that the owners have handled this has only reinforced our very worst thoughts about what they might be like. And I know in the Bay Area, we're down on Jed York from the 49ers, but I have to say, from the beginning, he said 
Colin Kaepernick has a perfect right to express himself. He can take a knee. He said the players are our most important partners. And compare and contrast that with Jerry Jones from Dallas, who said any player who does that will, be, will not play. And one player did raise his fist and mysteriously was taken off the team. The NFL's in conflict. They're not sure what to do about this. Mm -hmm. But their most important product is those players. Those are the ones that they have to. And the only thing I would say, and, and I actually talked to Eric Reed about this, the guy in the 49er locker room, who's, who's the de facto head of the 49er uh, protest. The one thing that they need is, what is it specifically that we would like to have? What, what's your win? Would it be a commission of owners and players put together to talk these things through? Would it be public service announcements where players say, we're concerned about these, this violence against black people in, in the United States? What is it? Because if it's going to be end racism, it's going to be tough. You, that's not a win. But they have the leverage. Now they need to say, here's what we want to do. We'll go to this point, and here's the way forward. And I think that's where they're, that's where they're a little a little lost with it. But right now the owners are all over the map. I would say the Texans who were very, the Dallas Texans, I mean the Houston Texans who were very upset with their owner's comment, which understandably, that's a, one of the dumbest things I've heard somebody say in quite a while. Um, Non-presidential things. <laughs> 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 um, they were prepared, there was talk they wouldn't play, there was talk they were going to take the decals off their helmets, there was talk, and, and so 40 some of them kneeled, knelt in Seattle. And there were not boos. There were not catcalls. I mean, I don't think, I don't think the owners are getting the, are getting a correct read on the American public either. I don't think, I don't think people are that upset about it. Kaepernick, Kaepernick sat down for the national anthem for three games before anybody even noticed. <laughs> Somebody finally took a photo and said, "Do you realize he's not standing up for the national anthem?" And they're like, "What? How did? I didn't know that." This thing has taken on a life of its own, but I think. We've got a lot of people telling us what we should think, when actually the, the reality is, I think there's some very thoughtful discussions going on, and something good could come out of this, but we need a, an objective. That's the conclusion of my sermon. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing with Kaepernick is that he did this, he didn't call attention to what he was doing, he did it on his own. Mm -hmm. And if nobody would have asked him about it, he probably would still be on the team, <laughs> well, maybe not. But he may be on a team, yeah. but he may still be kneeling, and no, and and that would be the end of it. But can you imagine um, had the president um, in his tweets said, "Listen, I don't agree with what you're doing. I understand you have the right to do it, and let's talk." Can you imagine how that would have changed this whole dynamic? And you probably would have gotten a get, but to come out and 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 frame it as being anti-American, against the flag and all that, that's just being, I mean, people in the, I was in the military and, you know, and I, I didn't fight, fight, but I, I served so that people have the right to their free expression. And that's what this is. And for people to say that, you know, you ought to be taking another woman's shot. Um, I was on the Hornet when they had a sermon uh, on 9-11 and one of the docents was saying, if I had just five minutes in the room with him, I'll beat his ass. It's like, what? Why, you don't even understand why he's doing it. It's not because to disrespect the flag. is He recognizes a problem, and he wants us to deal with it, and this is his way of getting a, calling attention to it. Carson, any thoughts? I, I just think I mean, there's two schools of thought with when it comes back to the Trump situation and, the, uh, mm -hmm. and everything he's kind of done with this, with this, uh, with this issue. Um, <clears throat> that he's strategic or that he's just a hot, he's a hothead. Um, and... I don't really know yet, and I don't think really anyone knows yet, kind of which one it is. Was this strategy of him to really kind of create a distraction, really get his base riled up, really try to you know motivate his supporters in a way that um, he needs them continually, continually motiva motivated, mm -hmm. um, and then kind of create a distraction in the news so that other things that are going wrong in D.C. don't really kind of make it into you know the, the headlines. Um, or was this him waking up one morning and just being really mad, um, honestly really mad, getting on his Twitter, starting rambling, and then he's kind of stuck in it, um, and he's not one to ever back out, back down. 
And so he keeps on going, keeps on going, keeps on going. And then all of a sudden you have an entire White House operation that has to then kind of co-opt it because now it's the president doing it. Um, and both are very plausible explanations for all of his, really all of his behavior, but on this one in particular. Um, and I don't think we'll really quite know quite yet um, kind of which one it is. Is this a real great strategist who really knows how to manipulate uh, the media and the public opinion and his supporters? Or is this an individual who is, gets really passionate about r really odd things um, and then really kind of goes down that route? And because he's the president of the United States, we kind of have to go with him. Right. Uh, we don't have to go with him. <laughs> well, his team has to go with him. <laughs> they have, have to, to respond. Yeah, have to respond. But a good, John's question is the, is the key to this. What was he trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Was he trying to get people to quit kneeling at the national anthem, or was he trying to stir up a big, fat controversy? He's in Alabama. He's giving a speech. They love football in Alabama. It's a conservative place. Let's call him a bunch of SOBs and get him off the field. And the place went crazy. You know, Did he think that through? Or as Carson said, was he just kind of a hothead in the moment he thought, this, this will play well, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to back down. And now I think he's thinking, actually, this is, this is a good thing for me. I look strong here. He looks strong, but he also does does these things a lot of times in his speeches where he just throws things out there. You know, Obama never called people. You know, um, you know, Obama never came to visit the Boy Scouts. I mean, these are the kind of things that he says off the cuff that are just flat out wrong. And I I just don't think he's strategically doing that. I think it just pops in his head and he says it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way it seems to me. Entirely um, possible. Yeah. You know, I don't know. We have so many things to talk about tonight. <laughs> we don't even have on our list the whole John Kelly and the soldier's mother and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> exactly. This would be a three-hour program. We do want to talk a bit about uh, one of the biggest news stories around here recently, and that's the wine country fires. Um, I mean, even a number of you who have been here during, the, during those fires remember looking out those front windows and not even being able to see across the bay because of the smoke. Um, Bob, what do you think will be the impact of this? What, what do you think, uh, you know, federal, state, local leaders did or didn't do right? I think things were done right. I think the local, the first responders, they got there. I mean, I got up, the, the fire started Sunday night, Monday morning. Um, I was out of town. I was in L.A. at our convention, and I got back. I got up there on on Friday, I worked up there on Friday, and by that time they had a thousand firefighters, you know, on the lines. But don't forget, there were like six or seven fires going, so they needed all those resources. The resources, I and I saw trucks from Southern California. I was going, I was driving up there on Saturday, and a couple of uh, San Diego Gas and Electric utility trucks passed by. The pole setters with the big drills and all that. They they had people coming from all over the state. We had firefighters from Canada, from from Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got the resources we needed, and that thing happened. It happened very quickly. You know, God forbid if they had done that in Puerto Rico, we wouldn't be talking about it still. But they had what they needed right away. The tragedy up there was going, and I, I saw this in 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 in, in Katrina. You get 7,000, 5,000 homes which are lost. People now are now dealing with their insurance companies. We heard today that $3.3 billion in claims have been filed and notified to the, to the Department of Insurance. These folks all have to rebuild. And there's a couple of things that I worry about. The first thing I worry about is contractor fraud, because that was very serious in Katrina. But not even contractor fraud, it's also the issue of how can I get a contractor to come rebuild my house? You know, these guys are already, they were already busy is that time of the year. The only thing that's the savings grace is that we're now going into the fall. And some of these folks usually slow down. So there will be people available to do the rebuilding, but will there be enough to rebuild all these homes in a timely fashion before the rain start? No. It's also gonna put extreme pressure on probably the single biggest problem, policy problem in the state of California, which is land use permitting. Uh, it, mm -hmm. The arcane system that uh, is imposed on us by mostly local governments. Mm -hmm. uh, the state has very little control um, over kind of what uh, the, the local permitting process uh, actually is, um, is going to make this extraordinarily difficult for everyone um, in the, the, the Bay Area, particularly in the, in the impacted areas. These are areas that were already very l low growth, anti-growth, 
policies in place and now you're going to have to really try to dump as much building and as much growth as possible into a system that really is not designed it's actually designed to counteract that um, and so it's going to be very difficult it's going to i think it's going to really spark um, and i hope it does spark a statewide debate about really kind of what is the role um, of state versus local government when it comes to housing policy, when it comes to land use policy. I think and, it's going to be necessary. And luckily, that's not a problem in San Francisco. Not, so, yeah. not at all. <laughs> no. You guys got it down really good here. The, the concern that I would have is, is this the new normal? A, a month before these fires, uh, my wife and I were up in Washington State and in Oregon. And uh, we were in Portland and staying in a place. And I came out to get in the car, and the car was covered in ash. There were... There were fires all over that area, wildfires. And I think we've got to look at what this is. It, it, certainly we have to look at what causes them, but also once those fires get going, it's crazy. And I, I didn't cover this fire. I, I was, I was out, of, out of the news business, but I did cover a couple of years ago we had the fires. And those fires, we, we covered a lot of people who had ranches, who had cabins, who had places in the mountains, and they lost their homes, and it was terrible. But to see block after block in Santa Rosa and to hear stories of people, we had a guy doing some work at our house and he said his brother-in-law and his wife left in their pajamas. It happened that quickly. That's terrifying. And, and I don't know that we've got a good reason to say that's not going to happen again. And to, honestly, to see chunks of a city like Santa Rosa absolutely devastated that's got to be terrifying. And that's got, I don't know what we do, but I'd like to see somebody address that. It's kind of understandable when you're in a rural area and you're surrounded by trees and brush. Um, we're building in places now we would never have built before. Normally, years ago, those fires spark and you let them burn out. But now you can't because you have homes and everything else up in there. And one of the things that, uh, that Feinstein said and, and, and Kamala Harris said during the news conference up in Santa Rosa is that there's an arcane rule that the U.S. Forest Service, their budget doesn't have money in it for fire prevention. It only has money for fire suppression and not even enough of that. And so they have to go to FEMA. FEMA does not consider wildfires to be a national or natural disaster. So there's not enough money even in there for to take out the dead trees. So that's something they're working on right now up, up in, up in, uh, over in Washington to get that law changed. But, you know... The land use policy absolutely is a problem. The fact that you had the subdivisions, which was not in a rural area, that burned down. I mean, it was just like the Oakland Hills Fire. One of the guys I talked to was an Oakland firefighter who lost his home up in Santa Rosa. And I wanted to talk with him. Uh, and I heard him on our air a couple of days later. He actually he lived in the Parkwood Apartments on, on October 19th, 2000, or 19, was it, 1991. He had to run for his life from the Oakland Hills fire. And now he's a firefighter, and he had to flee his house up in Santa Rosa that burned to the ground. You know, one of the supervisors, Susan Gorin, she lost her house, and she's there at this community meeting trying to tell people what they had to do, and she, she knows from firsthand experience dealing with the insurance companies. This is going to happen again, because look around when you have these developments in these areas that are built up, you know, and they're surrounded by trees. That's a recipe for disaster. And it, it, to your point, Bob, it takes a lot of time and resources to do so. Uh, Pepperdine University is actually a staging ground for Los Angeles County for when uh, wildfires hit um, pretty much anywhere in L.A., but specifically in kind of the north L.A. Um, county area because they spend lots of resources making sure that the entire campus is really fireproofed in a way. Mm -hmm. And they, they spend a lot of time and a lot of money to do so. Now, granted, they're doing it because they have lots of students that are living on campus and, and it's a necessity. Uh, but it goes to show you the importance of really prepping your surroundings um, to ensure that you can really try to stop these fires as they're coming toward you. Um, and as a result, uh, you need to have those resources um, at, the, at, at the end of the day. One last thing. All those folks who lost homes and apartments, they had no place to go because housing was already tight there. I talked to one woman, her husband, they're winemakers, they had a cabin up in the mountain, they think they lost that. They saw a place, they were looking for a place to move to, $1,700 a month. After the fire, $2,700 a month, just like that. Well, I'm sure we will be talking about these again, uh, unfortunately, and maybe with uh, increasing frequency. Uh, before we get to the news quiz, let me 
pull together a couple of questions here from the audience into one. Um, we obviously started off talking about Donald Trump, uh, the controversies there. And the person, some, one person says, when can we expect Democrats to put forward a positive agenda rather than just, we're not Trump, we hate Trump? <laughs> Any chance of that or is that is, or in kind of touching on, I think, a point Chuck made, are the divisions in the Democratic Party itself preventing them from, from being able to put forward such an agenda? I think so. You think so? I think so. Well, I'll ask when will the Republicans put forward a, a <laughs> um, They're still talking about Clinton and Obama. I mean, <laughs> you control the entire, the entire uh, D.C. system right now. Um, come on. And I think the narrative when the Republicans won control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency was now they're going to get some things done. And I think the Democrats said, now you're going to see what it was like for us for all these years. It's has to be bipartisan. You have to, it has to be, there's a series of checks and balances. You're not going to get as much done as you think you're going to. And, you know. Governing is hard. And, ter and turnabout, fair play. I, and, and I would say the most. Not if we get anything done, but yeah. The most vocal activists in the Democratic Party don't really want a positive agenda. You go to any of these large gatherings of people, it's, it, and sign this waiver, or sign this petition to impeach Trump, sign this to impeach Trump, Pence, and Ryan, sign this, sign that. Um, it's not necessarily about a, a pro agenda. And we saw this, you know, in the 2008 to 2016 time period with the Republicans. You go to any of these large things, it's about impeaching Obama, it's about stopping Obamacare. It's not really any sort of positive uh, message, positive movement on any sort of policy. Uh, they've been talking about stopping Obamacare f since 2010, yeah. and they get control of all the, the, the different levers, and they don't have a plan right. to right. get rid of Obamacare. Right. <laughs> They're scrambling to try to put, piece something together. So it's just not the, the, the way, unfortunately, that uh, politicians think or act. Well, and the fir you know, first thing Mitch McConnell said when Obama was elected was our, our primary focus is to make sure he's a one-term president. Mm -hmm. And that was the day after the, uh, yeah. it was the night of the inauguration in yeah. 2009. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, talk about Just say no to anything he wants yeah. to do that's going to help the country. 2010? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, thank you to our great panel today Chuck Nevius, Carson Bruno, and Bob Butler. Thanks to all of you here and, our, and everyone watching and listening online. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>